Now welcome to another Let's Talk Some Andor, where this time we will be discussing the 12th and final episode of Season 1. We will be looking at some of the comments left on my review over on the other channel and responding to them. And so, if you haven't seen this episode yet, obviously, spoilers ahead. And as usual, we will begin with your very, very brief review of this episode. Fantastic. A lot of the things that they were hinting at, a lot of side conversations, you, if you were, you're paying attention throughout the season, had payoff, which was kind of a beautiful thing. A lot of payoff, a lot of strong emotions again in this episode, because the show has so much heart. There is no wasted scenes or moments in the in this series. Everything has meaning. Everything will come back and be relevant. And mm -hmm. you have to pay attention or you will miss things. Mm -hmm. And yes, the emotion is absolutely there. But anyway, before we discuss too much, let us get to the comments and begin, as always, with the top-rated comment from the video. All right, this comes from Life After Phasma. I want to thank Thor for his positivity all this season of Andor. There's been a lot of infighting in the fan base about this show, but Thor has maintained his calm and rationality, and every review has been wonderful to hear. The show is something to celebrate, and if people didn't like it, I just hope they can be happy for those who did. Hopefully it grows in popularity and Season 2 improves upon Season 1 to embrace even more fans. Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, thank you for the kind words, of course. And it's my pleasure to... You know, talk Star Wars with all of you. It's a, it's an honor in my in my view, really. And I mean, I I hope the same about season two, or by the time we get to season two, that some more fans and more people in general will find this show. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been I, I know I saw, I'm a broken record, but it's phenomenal. It is some of the best Star Wars we will ever see. It is it is that good in my opinion. And if you happen to be someone who doesn't like it, that's that's fine. I mean, I know I spent a long time talking about, you know, the sequel trilogy. I, I didn't like them, but I never had an issue with people who like them. I think that's absolutely fine. So, you know, this is kind of a, a shoe on the other foot sort of scenario. And if you don't like it, that that's fine. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have an issue with you. Just as long as you don't have an issue with me enjoying it this time around. All right, next comment comes from Azure. Brasso beating Imperials over the head with Marvis Corpse Brick was way cooler than any possible reveal of Marva still being alive and having a big rebel moment. Yeah, she got her big moment anyway. Hey, she still got to kick ass. She did. I think she Post kicked more ass this way than she would have any other way. <laughs> that tells you something. I mean, the emotions even that Brasso felt come over and you you kick B? Really? You <laughs> that kick was a B? mistake. Who was in mourning? The biggest mistake the Empire oh. ever made was then, kicking B2 over. You know, this is Sparta. We just kick oh, him God, down yeah. and pummel him with Marva. Anvil guy. I loved Anvil guy. <laughs> Anvil guy was good, too. He also Sparta kicked. A lot of Sparta Oh, kicking. there was a lot of Sparta. Yeah, I thought you were talking about Anvil guy Sparta no, kicking. No, no. Brasso did it Brasso first. Brasso did some Sparta kicking, yeah, too. Yeah, he, after he kicked over B, he got kicked. <laughs> oh, that's right. And Ooh. then he got bricked. And then he got, he got Marva. Yeah, that's a, the, not the bricked that the Ferrix people talk about, but a different kind of bricked there. Mm. Bricking someone with a brick. Yeah. But going on this comment with the Marva still being alive and secret thing, Tony Gilroy didn't, uh, he thought it was an interesting theory. Yeah, he talked about We he, talked about that in the video yesterday. He did an interview where he mentioned the fact that he thought it was an interesting theory. I mean, it didn't work for him and his setup and where he was going, but he thought it was okay. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, it was innovative. It was smart. Yeah. Yeah, Why I think not? the people who came up with the theory, you know, anybody who liked the theory just wanted, you know, Marva to get the moment. I yeah. think that was the important part. It wasn't so much that, you know, they wanted her to still be alive as much as they felt like she deserved something. And after we got it, it felt like, yeah, she did deserve that and it was well executed. After a speech of emotional and riveting speeches, it's it's hard to rank them. It's incredible how many monologue slash speeches there were in this and how good they all were. All right, the next comment comes from Posan Theory. I didn't really feel Nemec's death in episode 6, but it came back around through the voiceover of his manifesto and just hit me like a ton of bricks. I couldn't help but tear up. Was that a pun? I, or? Well, a ton of credits. <laughs> a ton of credits, yeah. I, I agree. I think I mean, it, Nemec's death, it did hit me and was sad, but I didn't feel like I really knew him. But then hearing his words, his impassioned beliefs later on, and seeing Cassian deliberately put that in his coat pocket and then put that coat onto Bix, and probably in the hopes of getting that message out there because... He was going to meet Luthen, where he didn't even know if he was going to live. Yeah, he was ready to die. So he he passed on 
Nemec's inspirations to such a broken individual. Just to, it was just, it's so powerful what Nemec's Nemec's words, what his rhetoric can bring. And, yeah, it's interesting because early in the season you kind of look at, or I at least kind of looked at Nemec as that young idealist who mm-hmm. hasn't been there and done that, right? You know, he's got, you know, I can fix the world. Granted, I'm young and haven't experienced it yet. Mm-hmm. Not, not saying that Nemec probably hasn't had some bad experiences to bring him to the, you know, the rebellion. But, you know, a lot of times when you're young, you're very idealistic and you think you can figure all this out. And so to have Castian, who has now been through it, hear those words and be able to kind of interpret them in his own way after his experiences and you know, you have the idealism kind of, you know, taking root in him now. Mm-hmm. It, it's great stuff. Like I said, and passing those words on to Bix, who has just been broken. Oh, yeah. I, I'm curious how much we'll see of Bix in, in season two and what what I becomes of her after that. How much is kind of left of Bix, if you will? Cause how she much looks, rebuilding has to happen. Yeah, she looks rough. Next comment is from Aether Horizon. We had three major speeches in this series. And the director did well to depict Star Wars in its true seriousness. You know, it was a good episode when Marva's speech evokes your feelings to make you hate the Empire. The tension, emotions of everyone's face, the ambiance during the scene, simply phenomenal. Seeing Luthen react was my breaking point. Seeing him realize that he truly shares his vision with ghosts, but at the same time feeling relieved that there's still hope for a rebellion and a war that he won't fight alone anymore. Simply put, 9.5 out of 10 series and episode. This is Star Wars, and we want more like this. Yeah, I mean, the Marva speech, it's its always, you know, you're sitting there, you know, on your sofa at home, whatever you might be doing, watching it, and, like, you feel like you want to get up and fight, right? So imagine the people there really, you know, experiencing it in the moment with others and the power that can, can no doubt have a speech mm-hmm. like that, and if it were, you know, real, of course. Right. I mean, there were times during that episode I got goosebumps, and that's so refreshing. To yeah, be like, to, you made me really feel and empathize. Yes. It was crazy just to watch how all of these characters, you see how they react in normal circumstances, then you see them just pushed further and further to the edge, and it explodes, and you see what they're willing to do. Yeah, the, the Marva speech, you know, the Brasso, the look on his face, the mm-hmm. kid, the, the, the bomber kid, the look on his face, like, God, right. that is... you watch earlier in the yeah. episode him building that bomb and looking at his, his father. His father, yeah. And with the ISB destroyed. And then when he's listening to this speech, you can just see it on his face, like, you know, this is for you, Dad, and it's just, God, I, I don't know how you don't feel something. You must be... Uh, a droid, besides B two M emo who has emotions. He has to say that yeah. droid. Because <laughs> well, yeah, he can bring Marvel. out their emotions too, can't he? Sir says I was quite literally shaking in anticipation during the funeral march because it was clear everything was about to blow, and yet we had no clue how it was going to go down. Such a phenomenal episode and phenomenal series so far. It's very true. Yeah, I mean, they're like, was... yeah, we got about two hours to the funeral. We just heard, yeah, about two hours, and all of a sudden the music starts, and you're <laughs> yeah. like. I know. It sounds like a call to arms. Yeah, you Oh, we Luthen told them they Bell. could have 40 people, and they, you see the ent- entire, entire town. town marching in. You, you, can't, you can't tell these people, no. Yeah, Luther and Bell are discussing it. It's a couple hours from now, all of a sudden, you know, dong. And, you're like, and they're like, oh, I guess that's a, a bad sign or a good sign, depending mm-hmm. on your point of view. No, yeah. never send anyone after a guy in the anvils. Yeah, I was very curious. The show, and I kind of brought it up in my other review, the show didn't really make it clear if that was kind of an intentional thing to give cover to Andor, or if it's just kind of an act of defiance on its own? It was probably both. I, I do wonder if it, I mean, yeah, it was, I mean, I, clearly it was an act of defiance one way or the other, but I wonder how much it was planned or not planned that wasn't made clear that was one of those things I mean, kind of left open for interpretation. During the month Cassian was gone, Marva had declared herself a rebel. Yeah. You don't think she talked to other people in the town and was trying to slowly rally them into, we have to stop letting the Empire tell us what we can do all the time. So when they said to the Empire, this is what time we want the funeral, and they're like, yeah, we told them they have to push it back two hours, because they're just exerting authority yeah, just they to just, exert exactly. authority. Exactly, yeah, because I have well, power over Well, we told them we you, can't have the you. road, and then we're like, okay, you can use the road. And then, oh, you guys can limit it to this many people. They were tired of just constantly being told yeah. what to do. So I, I think it was a bit of both. I mean, you had Marva... You know she was in the background telling these people they're pushing us too far, they're pushing too much, yeah. and then they keep pushing, and the whole yeah. town stood up at one time. And kind of the weird irony is that the reason why they probably, the Empire didn't push back against Marva, or, and when they even say taking her into custody they probably would have killed her if they tried to torture her, is because she was just bait. So she was kind of allowed to do these things, you know, because of because of her son potentially coming home. Yep, she had, she had more freedom than uh, they and knew she should she have did, had. Yeah, and that was a mistake, wasn't it? Next comment comes from Iber Marcel. 
I appreciate they didn't make Cyril and Deidre kiss. <laughs> oh, but you could feel it in the air. There was, again. There like, was that, that te- I was like, was, the sexual tension was so thick for some reason. That was, that was a different type of tension, yes. That was crazy tension. The, yes. I just think I, neither one of them knows what to do to take that next step. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of got that feeling, too. Like, I don't think either one have really been in that situation before. No, and all of a sudden she's just you like, kinda, um, I should say thank you. And he's like, you, you don't, don't have to. You don't have yeah. to. Um, like, oh, no. As someone who's been on team, you know, Deidre from early on, I, I'm kind of glad they didn't make them kiss because it would have been a little a little bit of weird and much. Because they're at both the same missing time, that one thing that'll actually, like, they don't... Cyril doesn't seem to have much in the way of healthy relationship. His friend, subordinate, yeah. is the closest healthy relationship he seems to have. Yeah. So he probably doesn't, like, know what these feelings are even for Deidre that he might be having. Deidre. Deidre, see? I'm I've got it. you on the train, too. Oh. Welcome aboard. It's the little details, though, with these guys sometimes. It, it is. That's what that's what rounds out a show. That's I mean, what rounds out a character. Even the hat switching. The hat switching. I love the hat switching. Yeah. It, it makes sense. And then him and Mosk sitting together on the transport, they swap hats. A lot of people looked at that scene going, why do they swap hats? I looked at them like, they're like best friends. Oh, we both were given a, an item, let's say. You got the blue one and you hate blue. They gave me a red one and I have no preference on color. I'll just switch with you. Well, Mosk knows that <laughs> that Cyril likes a well-tailored a outfit. well-tailored suit, he, yeah. You know, he tailors his necklines, keeps everything trim and neat. And if you look at those two hats... The hat that Mosk is wearing would have been sloppy and too big on Cyril. Yeah. So the switch was probably just because they're friends and he knows them. And he's like, I know, I know, I know yeah. my boy over there. He probably he wants the hat, yeah. better tailored hat. Because there's no insignias or anything. They're just standard civilian hats Yeah. for going undercover. When, <laughs> I, I don't guess. think that's what the hats are for. Well, but yeah. they're, they're probably trying to hide their identity No, a I know, but bit. I mean, they're not, like, they're not like labeled undercover hats. Going <laughs> undercover? Pick up <laughs> this hat. like security detail hat. Yeah. Next from MP, I really love the world building done for Ferrix, down to their burial ceremonies in the flow of the day-to-day activities, things only contained within the community, like the bell tower and the clanging, which alienated the Imperials there, throwing them off. Seems like a great strategy. Also, I'm glad everyone who I think matters have lived to see season two. Yeah, no major deaths. No, I, I thought this was going to be a bloodbath. And yeah, almost a surprise. And, you know, that was the subversion of expectations, you know, <laughs> that nobody died. But nobody I, di- yet. I'm, I'm curious what happens to Ferrix now. Well, those, t- those people not dying, though, then means they can be used against Andor later. True. If they find, you know, them and know that Andor possibly got them out. True. But no, I, I'm curious what happens to Ferrix. I mean, this is, I mean, this was an uprising, right? This, this was, was an striking uprising. back against, you know... If these people don't get out of town and don't run and find somewhere to hide, who knows what's going to happen to these people? Yeah. I this mean, whole community is going down. Is there going this. to be a mining accident on Ferrix or a, mm. a, a ship that blew its, you know, reactor and uh, everybody was killed? <laughs> quote unquote. Possibly. I mean, we've heard of other things like that before, so. Next from Ron Falk. Loved how the finale held true to the rest of the season and that it was the normal everyday people rising up against the Empire. Best Star Wars content in a generation. Yeah, that's what I love about it. I mean, I, I get the people who love lightsabers and Jedi, and I've talked before about the, the Luthan being a Jedi theory. I don't like that simply because I just want everybody in this show to be the average person in the galaxy, you know, standing up against, you know, tyranny. Because it we, feels more like a person who has no power stands up. Yeah, and we know Luke Skywalker's coming, right? We mm-hmm. know he's going to blow up the Death Star and he's going to, you know... Heroes are Palpatine. on the way, Yeah, but everyday people have to show that they... That this is what they want. Yeah. The, the, you By know, Luke, striking out and showing us what's in their heart. Yeah. The Jedi's coming. Luke will be a legend. That's all great. But we're seeing the roots of what leads Luke to have the chance to blow. As I've said before, we're, we're seeing the, the rebellion that he's going to join mm-hmm. and, you know, be the figurehead of, if you will. I mean, even heroes like Wedge Antilles, he was a regular guy who yeah, stood up. That's what I love about Wedge. He's not a, you know, he lives through every major battle, basically, in, you know, in the original trilogy. He's there and he lives and he, you know, he blows up the second Death Star along with Lando. So it, just, and then Lando's another guy, you know, just, just an everyday guy. Just adding to the list of heroes. Yeah. Brasso, he's now, he's now a rebellion hero for me. You yeah, know, they all are. Marva, rebellion hero. Everybody who stood up that day and, you know, on Rick's road is a hero, the rebellion. I mean, it's crazy because that's the road that those clone troopers marched down years yeah. ago and gunned down civilians. Yeah, that's or where Clem hung civilians. Yeah. 
And now they've turned it into a site of their own victory. Exactly. It's, you know, they're, they're taking it back. Next comment is Andrea Servkamo. Today's episode must be the first time in years that Deidre had a real fear for her life and that it wasn't something that she could fight her way out of. Pretty sure Cyril earned himself at least two gold stars dragging her out of it and will be interesting to see what Tony Gilroy has in store for them and everyone else. Brasso swinging Marva's funerally stone as the first weapon was very appropriate and great to see. Yeah, Deidre, extremely strong, competent female character. Mm -hmm. And yet she has a weakness, right? She's not going to, you know, pull out her blaster and shoot ten, you know, civilians and get out of there herself. She got overpowered. She dropped her gun. She was terrified, yeah. I mean... What was, it, she, what was she supposed to do? It was a mob. Yeah, she's a great character. I mean, one thing I found really interesting is we saw later that Cinta stabbed her subordinate, which means she has a job opening if Cyril still wants to be in the ISP. <laughs> that's, that's right. There's an opening for, <laughs> for Cyril. I feel like this is how Cyril gets into the ISB. No, I, I, I absolutely think Cyril has his in now. This is what he's always wanted. Yeah. And to work underneath Deidre, it's, it's like his dream job. It's exactly what he wants. I mean, he has an obsessive personality. I mean, you've heard in so many interviews and stuff how he's obsessing this whole time well, over Andor. The uniform and the he's also everything, yeah. obsessing over Deidre. Yeah, that's that's his you know mm-hmm. that's his problem. He is very obsessive. You know, probably a little OCD. You probably could say. with the tailoring suits and yeah. everything, and the, wouldn't let go of the, the 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 two men who died on Morlana. Yeah, his pursuit of justice. Like mm-hmm. when he gets something in his head, he's <laughs> <laughs> not that kind of justice. Justice. Christian Yen, that episode had so many moments that hit. Andor's expression when Brasso told him his mom's last words. Mon Mothma's play using her husband against the Empire. Luthen's face as he watched the townsfolk die. Andor getting Bix out of the garrison. Brasso hitting Imperials with Marva's death brick. I'm flooding with, with the imagery. I loved that final moment when Andor appeared on Luthen's ship too. The future spy, master of the rebellion, has come out and is showing his chops. He outplayed the biggest player in the game and surprised him. This was just so good. Yeah, I mean, it's all because, you know, there's setup and payoff, right? Exactly. That's what it is. I mean, we, you know, you hear people say, oh, it's kind of slow and, oh, there's filler episodes. It's You can argue it's slow if, if you know, if you don't like the pace, that's, you know, subjective, that's fine. But there, there's no filler in this. It's not filler episodes. It is set up. And then you get these eventual amazing payoffs. Our last comment today will be from The Frozen One. As a music teacher, I have really enjoyed listening to the varied opening credit scores and trying to guess what it could mean for each episode. The music in the last episode was especially unique. Bertel seems to have scored the instruments to play intentionally out of tune or scored in different adjacent keys, creating not just a dissonant sound, but an out of tune sound. I thought at first it was just meant to represent the brokenness under the tyranny of the Empire, but when the episode gradually showed the band members tuning their instruments and then each one trickling into a final unified dirge, it made me think this was meant to represent the trickling of people into the Rebellion, the change in hearts of the people of Ferex and around the galaxy which harkens back to Luthen's speech in Cassian and Nimic's manifesto. Each person present made a decision to not let the Empire scrape away at their lives anymore and instead come together in harmony to make a stand. Like musicians, they combined in purpose to play in tune as one body to do something in a rebellion against the Empire, come what may, because it's better to do something or even to die for a cause of freedom than barely live under tyranny. I was completely enraptured by the scene. Yeah, there's a difference between being alive and living life, right? Absolutely. It wasn't even just those speeches, just like uh, just like this comment says. The speeches were, were on par, but that music, the way that they used the music to give us expression and how it changed theme by theme, week by yeah. week, episode by episode, just really expressed how the, the tones of the episode and how they were meant to make you feel. Yeah, we had so many different types of, you know, I'm not a music expert, but... But I mean, just the, you know, in the, when we went to the Miami Vice planet, <laughs> <laughs> when we went to uh, ne- Nemos. Yeah, we had the club music. On yeah, Malena. we had kind of like the club music and yeah. we had some kind of, you know, more wonky, like 70s sci-fi mm-hmm. music. And, you know, there's, there was so many different types of music in there or score, you know, the score was so varied and it always just fit perfectly. And like I've said a hundred times, I feel like 
a good composer knows when to when their music needs to really drive in the emotion and when they need that silence. Yeah. And that silence can be just as powerful as anything else and this was handled so well. Yeah, the music I mean again, it's it's a nearly it's a virtually flawless show. There there's so many I mean I I normally can nitpick a show pretty easily unfortunately mm-hmm. but this i'm like uh there's i don't know something got to be wrong with this right it can't be this good and yet it and could. yet it is yeah it was like somebody went through ahead of you like a writer maybe like <laughs> like tony gillard who kind of nitpicked it all in advance who went yeah that's not quite right let's let's do this correctly yeah it's actually just quality writing it, it's so nice to just have you know airtight f- nearly flawless writing mm-hmm. what a concept <laughs> indeed <laughs> All right, well, that is all we got for you this time. So now it's your turn to take to the comments below and tell us what you thought of the 12th and final episode of Andor and what you thought of the series overall. Well, I guess the cat's going to let us know. (laughs) Either way, leave your comments below. Let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.